Here we go for another English language A-level video. We're looking at language diversity and today we are scrutinizing language, occupation and power. Okay, so this is getting ready for the paper two uh, AQA A-level and it's called language diversity and change. And you could well get a question like, for example, evaluate the idea that in public life, a person's occupation is the most significant influence on their language. Okay, so everything that we do in the video today will kind of introduce you to that. So we spoke of power a second ago. The person to reference there is somebody called Norman Fairclough. Norman Fairclough differentiates between influential and instrumental power and how they affect language. So let's look at this idea of influential and instrumental power. What is the difference between them? I will explain. So instrumental power is the power of people with higher authority. Okay, so it's quite explicit. When we're talking about higher authority, we're talking about maybe the government or legal system or your place of work or management or even, dare I say, your school or your college, like the teachers or the head teachers there. They have power to make you do stuff. That's called instrumental power. And they set clear expectations. You must follow the instructions. Uh, and if you don't follow the instructions, there will be consequences. So there'll be penalties if you don't do it. And in their language, if you've got instrumental power, it means that you don't necessarily need to be converging. So you don't need to converge with your receiver because you've already got a high level of power. Let's look at a text which is doing this instrumental power. This is an exam poster on a wall in a college. No mobile phones, iPods or MP3 or 4 players. Possession of unauthorised items is an infringement of the regulations and could result in disqualification from the exam and the overall qualification. So remember what I said about little attempt to converge with the receiver? So that's what's going on in that first sentence there. It's elliptical. It's a minor sentence. It's a non-standard sentence. It doesn't need to be standard because it's just laying down a rule. OK, and it's a high level of precision. It's itemizing the things that you're not allowed to bring into the exam hall. And in the second sentence, it's sort of bunged up with a whole load of abstract nouns. So words like possession, infringement, regulation, examination. They all tend to be Latinate root. So originally the words come from Latin and they tend to be polysyllabic. Either tend to be long words and they're abstract. So that what they do is they lift the level of register and therefore create the sense that these people are important. These are the rules that I must be following. Notice occasionally the use of graphological features like the screaming caps that we've got on the word disqualification that are there to, to, to put the fear of God into you. And then you've also interestingly got a modal auxiliary verb there. Now, you might expect an instrumental power to be full of deontic modal auxiliary verbs, words like must or should or will. But actually, it's got one that looks like an epistemic, i.e. a low force modal auxiliary verb. So it's an epistemic modal auxiliary verb, but actually it's got a deontic function because it's basically saying, well, if you don't follow these rules, we could disqualify you. We might choose not to. The power is in their hands. These are all features of instrumental power. Now, that's to be contrasted with what Fairclough is calling influential power, which you will see all around you. So here we've got an advertisement with old blue eyes. It's Frank Sinatra. OK, so this is the power of language to try and influence you. So here language is being used to make you behave in a certain way or for you to, to do something or change your opinion. It's not about force, so it's different to instrumental power in that respect. And there is no penalty for not following the guidance. So when we're looking at advertising, we're quintessentially looking at influential power. Let's look at an example. So this is from Monarch Airlines. This is a piece of their marketing. Let's go. Win a pair of flights for the Monarch Map Quiz. Have our fantastic holidays put you in the mood for some fun? Test your monarch knowledge and you could be jetting off to one of our stunning sunny destinations. 
Look out for the Monarch Map Quiz on Facebook. Answer the destination question correctly. And you'll be entered in a weekly prize draw. Yes, we're giving away a pair of flights every week. Don't miss out. Get into the travelling mood with our weekly draw. Now, it's very important when you're analysing any texts in English language, English language air level that you don't just comment on Lexis. Okay, obviously the words are important, but there are other language levels that you know a lot about that you need to be applying your knowledge from. I'm talking about grammar, phonology, discourse, graphology, etc. So here, if we're looking at grammar, we could deconstruct the use of the sentence functions, couldn't we? Now remember, there's four sentence functions classically in English because you've got declaratives, exclamatives, imperatives, and interrogatives. And have you noticed in this text that we haven't just got boring old declaratives, i.e. statements, but we've got a lot of direct address going on. So we've got imperatives, like in the first sentence, win a pair of flights. We've got interrogatives, like the second sentence, have our fantastic holidays. And what this does is that creates a kind of pseudo relationship, i.e. what Norman Fairclub is calling synthetic personalization, where the text producers are pretending that they have a kind of very direct relationship with you. OK, so that comes through the sentence functions and it also links in with their use of pronouns as well. So have you noticed the use of first person plural pronouns? Have our fantastic holidays. So the hour there is that collective inclusive use of a pronoun. And you've also got lots of use, haven't you? You've got those second person pronouns, which again give that sense that this, this text knows you. It's personalizing it, they're addressing you. Okay, so those are a couple of grammatical features. In terms of Lexis and semantics, you've got, got quite a lot of the heavy lifting being done by modifiers here. So words like the pre-modifying adjective fantastic, so extremely emotive, hyperbolic kind of adjective that's used. And in the third sentence, you've got stunning and sunny. So those pre-modifiers play upon phonology as well because they give you some sibilance and the repetition of those S sounds maybe put you in mind of all kinds of sunshine and sand, etc. So we've got those features. We've also got discourse features of things like groups of three. So in that fourth paragraph that begins, look out for the monarch map quiz. You've got three things that are being given to you. And that's a very common persuasive rhetorical technique. And look what's going on in that last paragraph as well. Yes, we're giving away a pair of flights every week. So it's almost like they're engaging in a conversation with you. It starts there with that positive adverbial, yes. It's almost answering uh, an adjacency exchange that's going on. These are all very typical influential power language features. Think about the different occupational areas that are out there. Hundreds and hundreds of different work areas that people are engaged in. The point about them is they all have their own distinctive, sometimes peculiar discourses. For example, the police force. Let's have a look at some of these discourses. So I'm going to throw at you a, a, a sentence, a tiny little bit of text, and I want you to identify the occupational area and analyze two language features. Let's go. Here we are at a place that's very beloved to my heart. This is Darlington train station, one of the coldest places in the entire universe. Virgin Rail apologizes for the late arrival of the 353 from York. This was due to a point failure at North Hamilton. So very common distinctive bit of occupational language that's going on here. How would you analyse it? Well, I would draw attention to the following sorts of things. First of all, it doesn't say, I'm sorry. It says, Virgin Rail apologises. So what you've got there is nominalisation. So nominalisation means using the abstract noun form. And what that does is that this demonstrates that this isn't a personal message that's coming through. It's representing uh, an organisation. And therefore, it's conveying distance and authority. It's difficult to argue with if it's a whole organisation that's talking to you. 
Also, you've got this mental verb apologizes. It doesn't say sorry, it says apologizes. So it's using this high register polysyllabic verb and standard sentencing. Always a good idea to draw upon Martin Yaus's five levels of register. They're there in the textbook. You've got frozen, formal, consultative, casual, and intimate. So here you've got a formal level of register. And what that does is it creates negative face. Remember, negative face doesn't mean being negative. Oh no, negative face means using language in a very polite, respectful way in order to give the other person options and distance. Okay, what else have we got? Points failure. Hmm, what does that mean? Subject specific lexis from the semantic field of railways. It sounds technical, doesn't it? But it's also quite vague as well. <clears throat> and then finally, grammatically, you've got your short sentences. Short sentences make sense because this is an announcement uh, for people listening. So the, the shorter the sentence, then the less demands it's being put on the listening audience. So those are some of the occupational discourse features of train announcements at a station. Here I'm going to give you five other slices of discourse and you have to identify from what work area they come and then you have to pick apart some of the language features. Let's go. Dearly beloved, we are gathered today to celebrate the life of Paul Heselton, a cherished member of this parish. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you do say may be recorded and used as evidence in courts. Press 1 if you wish to make a new claim. Press 2 if you have an existing claim. Press 3 if you have an inquiry about your cover. A 27-year-old female presented with a <coughs> pneumothorax, which progressed into a rapidly degenerative bronchiolitis obliterans organising pneumonia. West Indies really turning on the heat here with four slips, a gully, a short mid-wicket and a silly mid-on. Right, let's go back through these and say some interesting things about them. Dearly beloved, we are gathered today. Now, this is clearly uh, spoken in some kind of religious context. So perhaps this is a priest or a vicar that is addressing a congregation. And that's why we've got this consciously archaic language that's being used. Now, so many occupational areas rely upon very up-to-date language with lots of neologisms. If, for example, you're doing a car advertisement, it's likely that you're going to be using language in all sorts of very new creative ways. Not so in church. Okay, so church is about tradition. It's about the continuation of cultural traditions that have gone on for centuries. And that's why we sometimes have this archaic language that's being used. Beloved, for example, would be a good example of that. Or parish, for example, this discourse community. Um, notice the quite high level of register here as well. So this is somebody who is reading from a script. So we've got high level of register. And notice also the use of euphemism. Because here, these people are clearly not there just to party, they are there to mourn. But they're using, this person is using this word celebrate here. So it's euphemistic use of language that's being used, that's trying to shape and position the audience's response. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you do say may be recorded and used as evidence in court. This is a great example of what Yaus would call the frozen level of formality. And it's the frozen level of formality because it has to be said by a by person in a certain position in a certain context. And it affects and changes reality in that way. So here we've got a police officer who is arresting somebody and they need to say these words in this way in order to, it, for it to come into effect. The language itself is relatively straightforward, I mean, mainly monosyllabic, actually, in, certainly in that first sentence with that direct address. And that's clearly because, you know, everybody needs to understand the language. You know, it can't be such a high level of register that the person who's being arrested doesn't actually understand the process and what's happening to them. OK, but you have high register in the second sentence because you've got the use of the passive voice. So may be recorded and used. 
And what this does, it formalizes and depersonalizes the process. This is a great example of what the 1970s uh, philosopher Austin would call a performative. So by uttering these words in this particular context, reality is changed. Press one if you may, wish to make a new claim. Press two if you have an existing claim. Okay, so we've all been stuck on the phone where we've had to listen to a set of instructions. They may well be mechanized. It may not actually be a human being that's giving you these instructions. So we've got lots of syntactical repetition here where we've got the same sentence structures being repeated again and again. We've got a main clause at the beginning of the sentence and then a conditional subordinate clause that follows it. So even though these sentences are short and straightforward, they're actually complex sentences because they've got subordinate clauses. So you've got the, the, the verb that's being foregrounded at the beginning, press one, and that's important because obviously people listening on the phone, they are they're listening and therefore they need to know what to do uh, in order to complete the instructions. Okay, so that's from some kind of call center and maybe it's about an insurance claim. The fourth one is interesting because it's full of very jargonistic uses of language. So jargon is highly technical language that's being used. And in this case, it's being used for fellow professionals to communicate with each other in a very precise and concise way. So this wouldn't be suitable if your doctor said this to you as a member of the public, but it would be very appropriate if you have two doctors who uh, have the right schematic knowledge in order to understand what's going on. And then finally, we have a cricket commentator who is saying West Indies really turning on the heat here. So like the previous one here, we've got jargonistic uses of language. You have to have a schematic knowledge in order to understand where these fielders are actually standing on the field. Where does a slip go? A gully? A short mid wicket? And why is that mid on being called silly? So you obviously need this schematic knowledge for that. But at the same time, because it's language done by a cricket commentator, then obviously it needs to be entertaining. And that's why you've got idiomatic metaphorical uses of language there turning on the heat. OK, so it's obvious that different occupational areas are going to be drawing upon very distinctive uh, discourses in their language. And in our next video, we will have a look at one particular uh, discourse, that of teaching. Thank you very much.